So thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, I'm uh, Nick Gambo. I'm one of the neurosurgery interns, uh, and I'm going to present a patient of Dr. Warner's. So this is a 45-year-old uh, right-handed woman with a history of Cartagener syndrome who presented to a clinic with one month of constant massive headaches with vertigo and one month of worsening memory. Uh, I've known she'd had basically chronic headaches her whole life uh, that were holocranial and occipital in quality, kind of varying uh, and acutely worsening. She rated them as seven out of 10 in clinic. They were ranging from five to eight out of 10. She also noted a one month of whooshing sound in her ears, which she'd had before and said her brain felt like an etch-a-sketch. She also reported a couple of recent episodes where she was having some synesthesia, basically hearing, seeing colors when she heard music. So past medical history is pretty extensive here. Uh, the, the things to take away here are uh, Cartagener syndrome, uh, notably the sinus inversus, her congenital hydrocephalus from aqueductal stenosis, uh, her uh, panoply of, of uh, VP shunt revisions, a third ventriculostomy, and an aqueductal stent. Um, she had uh, chronic headaches, optic neuropathy, seizures, um, some psych history, uh, and that's pretty much all I'll mention. Uh, social history, not contributory, and again, lots of uh, medications for anxiety, for pain, uh, for headaches, uh, and, and psych meds. Uh, her, her general physical exam was uh, pretty much uh, no, basically normal. Uh, neurologically, she was ando times four. Uh, cranial nerves were all intact, except for what I'll mention uh, in, the, in the opto exam. Uh, motor and sensory was intact, and reflexes were two plus throughout. Tenometry was equal in both eyes. Um, she did have this afferent pupillary defect in the left eye, and that's some slight anisocoria, oh, not technically. But. Uh, on slit lamp exam, she had some trace injection and temporal uh, ping pinguecula uh, in the right eye. She had some nuclear sclerosis in both eyes and also had a nevus at 7 o'clock. Um, and then on fundoscopic exam, she had uh, basically some pallor uh, temporally in the left eye uh, and, and a cup to disc ratio that was slightly less in the left eye here. This is her visual field testing, and I'll show you her, her previous visual field testing, but uh, this is actually improved from previously. Uh, she kind of has kind of this partial uh, arcuate defect in the right eye, uh, and then this, kind of, this was actually, uh, you can see it previously, uh, more of a quadrant defect. Uh, on her previous exam back in 2015. So her vision was getting better. This is her, basically uh, her OCT RNFL uh, that was largely unchanged from her previous exam. Uh, you see basically some uh, retinal thickening uh, by bitemporally as well as uh, superior and inferiorly bilaterally. And this is her uh, MRI of her brain. So you can see here uh, that she's been surgerized pretty extensively, and I'll show you some kind of snapshots of all of her shunt tracks here. So uh, these are kind of her, these are her current shunts. So she has a right frontal shunt that kind of goes into the temporal lobe here, uh, where she had developed a cyst previously, and then she had a uh, also right frontal approach uh, catheter that you can see enters the ventricle here. Just for, you, for your curiosity, since we are talking about Cartagener syndrome and primary ciliary dyskinesia, you can see the classic uh, findings on abdominal CT of situs inversus. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, Cartagener syndrome uh, briefly here. So Cartagener syndrome is actually a uh, kind of a subset of primary ciliary dyskinesia. Uh, it's characterized by a triad or tetrad. Uh, in some patients of situs inversus, chronic sinusitis, chronic bronchiectasis, and infertility. Uh, and actually only represents about, uh, or situs inversus is only present in about 50% of patients with PCD. Uh, it has an autosomal inheritance pattern and kind of taking you back to your medical school days, uh, this is actually due to a defect in the dynean protein uh, that is uh, responsible for ciliary function. This is an animation of that protein that basically shows uh, kind of transports uh, these vesicles uh, in, towards the nucleus as opposed to the kinean or kinesin uh, that transports it in a uh, anterograde fashion and it's kind of said to walk like a drunken sailor here. So demographics, it's a very rare disease. It uh, represents a prevalence of about, of 
sorry, about uh, one in 20,000 to 40,000, kind of upper estimates of one in 120,000 is what I saw, has no uh, male or female predilection. Uh, and the natural history really, um, you know, they talk the most about uh, in the literature about bronchiectasis and kind of the pr chronic progression of that disease, as well as the chronic sinusitis, which uh, a lot of the fatigue and headaches that these patients have and present to medical attention for, uh, a lot of this, a lot of their symptoms are attributed to this. There are some patients uh, that have been shown to have hydrocephalus from the uh, from Cartagena syndrome and PCD, um, and basically the thought is that this is due to impaired ependymal cilia. There's other associated findings like infertility, which is classically more common in males, but females also have about 50 percent. Uh, infertility rate due to uh, impaired ciliary function in the fallopian tubes, and then again, recurrent otitis media. So they have a no normal lifespan, uh, typically. Um, they have kind of a more chronic or uh, slower progression uh, course of their bronchiectasis when you compare it to other diseases like uh, cystic fibrosis. So again, the treatment of Cartagena syndrome, because it's so rare, it, it's really based largely off of cystic fibrosis literature, and they really focus on chest physiotherapy and those basically symptomatic control. Uh, so I'll talk about a couple studies briefly. So this is a study out of UCLA back in 2002 that basically postulated that this Claudin-1 protein, which they found to, uh, it's, a, it's a structural protein involved in tight junctions typically. Well, they found it to be highly expressed uh, in the retinal pigment epithelium cilia. Um, and it wasn't present in other cilia, like in the gut, uh, in the airway, and so they postulated that this might be important for retinal development. That kind of has sparked some other projects that are um, not as convincing, but this is a case report basically of a 55-year-old patient who had uh, chronic angle glauco uh, glaucoma. Uh, they had some glaucomatous cupping, drusen, and retinal pigment changes uh, that were consistent with macular, uh, macular uh, in the macular region. Uh, they thought that this actually, these ophthalmologic findings, uh, and it's kind of a poorly supported in their discussion, but they attributed all these findings to the patient uh, having Cartagena syndrome and kind of, you know, reference back to this article for the development of the, of the retina. And then this is another uh, paper that also kind of referenced this original article. Um, this is a small case control study in 2011 uh, by Hoffman et al. that basically looked at um, the nerve projection fibers from the optic nerve um, in patients with KS and PCD. So their thought was, is because the clodden protein was uh, expressed at such high levels and so exclusively for retinal pigment epithelium, that obviously uh, patients with KS and PCD would have differential uh, projection fibers. And so they looked at visual evoked potentials, they basically calculated the difference in the potentials and looked at the tractography essentially uh, of the visual uh, system, and they found no significant difference, but still published the results. So kind of back to the original case, there doesn't really seem to be a whole lot of convincing evidence that uh, Cartagena syndrome is actually significantly associated and predictably associated with ophthalmologic findings. Um, in our patient, I think the, the uh, I think that uh, the most likely explanation for her visual field symptoms um, or visual field deficits were, was due to her multiple shunt failures, about 15 in her lifetime. She'd had multiple surgeries for those shunt failures. She'd had complications from those shunt failures. Um, so I think that was probably the likely contribu contributing factor. Um, and, as, and with reference to her headaches, you know, her, her presentation does sound a lot like a shunt failure, but she had actually had a shunt tap uh, in clinic at neurosurgery um, that had an opening pressure of about 18. So um, even though, you know, this is kind of a classic presentation for, you know, patients who come to the ER with shunt failure, um, but, uh, you know, kind of the gold standard is tapping the shunt or getting an LP with an opening pressure. So we think that a lot of her headaches were probably due to, um, you know, basically chronic sinusitis and her history of chronic migraine. These are my references. <laughs>